the academic horizon and to also emphasize the importance of academic research. Professor Maskin which will be presented by our Dean of the, the Graduate School, Dr. Cameron Bisset. I would first like to invite the Mr. Uwe Morave, Chairman of the International Peace Foundation, to deliver a few remarks about the bridge program. Thank you. Welcome to the third ASEAN event series, Bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace. Bridges is facilitated by the International Peace Foundation, which is a non-political, non-religious foundation, under the patronage of 21 Nobel Peace Prize laureates based in Vienna. <coughs> the events are hosted in cooperation with various local partners, including the country's major universities, and I would like to thank his Excellency Dr. Yves and the National University of Management for hosting our event today. Having started in November 2009, bridges will now be continuously held in Cambodia until April this year, involving the participation of Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, and economics, as well as other eminent keynote speakers and artists, including Hollywood, act, uh, Hollywood film director Oliver Stone, who will be here next week, Hong Kong actor Chucky Chan, or Chin Long, who has been here already in November, as well as world-renowned pianist Vladimir Ashkenazi, who will perform at the Chapman Theatre in March. The third ASEAN series of bridges is initiated by the United Nations General Assembly uh, in the year 2000. It follows a series of, up to now, 350 Bridges events, which the International Peace Foundation has already hosted in Thailand, in the Philippines, and Malaysia since 2003. 35 Nobel laureates, as well as 38 Dame Monita Roddick, the Reverend Jesse Jackson, Vanessa May, Jesse Norman, and Dr. James Wolfenson participated in these events. In Thailand, they were presided by Her Royal Highness Crown Princess Maha Chakri Sinton, as well as Her Majesty the Queen, and up to now reach an audience. As peace cannot be achieved instantly, but is a process which needs time, Bridges has not been organized as one single conference and then everything is over again and forgotten, but as an ongoing series of events in all parts of society as well as with the general public. With the basis for peace being education and synergies being the fruit of cooperation, the International Peace Foundation has not realized the bridges alone, but has carried out the program in cooperation with UNESCO and 102 national and international organizations, including 45 major universities and schools. The multidisciplinary and a realistic approach of bridges in Thailand, the Philippines and Malaysia, and of the events now in Cambodia, reflects that peace involves all parts of society. It involves awareness and social responsibility of politicians, the business community, scientists, artists, and the media. And since peace within ourselves, our families, and our environment, starts in our minds and hearts, it involves every one of us. In this sense, bridges challenges us to cross borders and to build bridges by listening and opening us to a world in which we will be able to understand each other and the complexities we face today in a new light. The globalized world needs broad strategies for change to secure a sustainable future for us and the next generations. Let us be inspired by the knowledge and the wisdom that Bridges continues to offer, an opportunity to think of ourselves and the world in which we live in and which we are able to create a new country. I thank Professor Eric Muskin, the 2007 Nobel Laureate for Economics, 
who has agreed to come to Cambodia to support the event. We look forward to his keynote speech and to his important contribution to build bridges. So, onward. <laughs> I would, like, I would like to now introduce Dr. Kemre Fizet, Dean of the Graduate School at National University of Management, to, uh, to deliver the presentation. The, um, of the National University of Management. Uh, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, with due respect, I would like to read the biography of uh, Professor Maskin as follows. Professor Maskin is an American economist who was awarded the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2007 for having laid the foundations of mechanism attempts to maximize gains for all parties within the market and which examines uh, whether trading mechanisms are the best ways of allocating resources. Professor Maskin is the Albert Hirschman Professor of Social Science at the Institute of Advanced Study and a visiting lecturer with the rank of professor at Princeton University's economics department. Professor Maskin attended Harvard University mathematics. After he earned his doctorate, Dr. Maskin went to the University of Cambridge in 1976, where he received an honorary MA degree. He taught as a professor at Massachusetts Institute of Technology from 1977 to named the Lewis Bergman Professor of e Economics in 1997. In 2000, he moved to the Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey. Today, Professor Maskin works in diverse areas of economic uh, theory, including game theory, economics of incentives, contract theory, and social choice theory. The European Economic Association an honorary fellow of St. John's College in Cambridge and a corresponding fellow of the British Academy. He was named Monash Distinguished Visiting Scholar at Monash University and honorary professor at Wuhan University and at Tsinghua University. He received various honorary doctorate degrees and he was awarded the Eric Kahn Award in environmental economics in 2007. Professor Maskin has served as editor or associate editor for many journals, including the quarterly journals of economics, economics lectures, social choice and welfare. All markets have failed to reduce inequality. As I see, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor Eric Maskin. Nice welcome. It's uh, a great pleasure to be here at the National University of Management this afternoon, and uh, to have the opportunity, the opportunity to talk to you about uh, a subject which has concerned me now for the development of global markets and inequality. Uh, this is a subject which I think has special relevance to the Cambodian situation, and uh, that's why I'm particularly excited about the opportunity of talking with you about it this afternoon. I think it's evident to us all that over the last 20 years or so, there has been an enormous increase in globalization. And by that I mean trade of goods and services between countries, so a great, a great deal more production of goods and services across national boundaries. Uh, the reasons for this, I think, are, are quite clear. Uh, thanks to Modern technology, it's now much less costly to send goods long distances. And perhaps even more important, it's now less costly to communicate over years. Uh, so in many parts of the world, tariffs are now much 
uh, is a free trade area. And now, uh, in this part of the world, we have the China ASEAN free trade area as of just a few weeks ago. Uh, and all of these uh, free trade groups have promoted globalization. Globalization has come with many promises. Globalization have argued that uh, globalization is the key to bringing prosperity to developing countries. And in fact, uh, this, uh, this promise has been realized in many cases. There, uh, many countries around the world, including Cambodia, have grown enormously thanks to global markets. Cambodia, for example, uh, has a uh, flourishing garment industry which uh, has succeeded in boosting Cambodian uh, exports considerably. And China and India improvements in their economies thanks to their exploitation of global markets. But there's another promise that globalization uh, made, which has not been realized. And that is to reduce inequality, to reduce the gap between the rich and the poor, the haves and the have-nots in developing countries. In fact, in most developing countries where global markets uh, have played a large role, over the last 20 years, we've seen inequality increase. And Cambodia is, again, an example. Uh, despite the considerable economic progress that Cambodia has made, inequality has increased significantly. Thank you. And that, I think, is cause for real concern. Uh, because rising inequality is troublesome. It's troublesome from uh, the standpoint, first, of we, I think we all believe that uh, all people should be treated equally. All people are, are born equal. And when there is, when are attributable not to pure merits, but to uh, the accident of where you happen to be born, that affronts our sense of morality. Uh, but even if you, even if uh, you may well be concerned with the elimination of poverty. And when inequality goes up in developing countries, we also see getting rid of inequality is also a way of getting rid of poverty. But even if you don't accept that uh, explanation for why we should worry about inequality, uh, there is a very practical reason which is that countries who are characterized by huge income disparities, by, by huge income inequality, also tend to be quite unstable politically. And so simply uh, for the purpose of keeping your country together, politically and socially, uh, it is important to deal adequately inequality. Now, I, I mentioned uh, a moment ago that inequality has in fact increased in many developing countries as a result of the recent globalization. 
Should we be surprised by that? I would say that there, there is a real sense in which this did come as a surprise. Uh, and that's because this increase in inequality contradicts one of the best established principles in economics, a principle which has withstood the test of time for over 200 years now, uh, namely the theory of comparative advantage. It has been a great success in helping us understand all the previous globalizations that have occurred in the last 200 years, and there have been many of them. Um, in each case, except for the most recent globalization, globalization led to a decrease in inequality in developing countries. So it's worth examining the theory of comparative advantage for a few minutes to see why it made the prediction that prediction turned out to be false. So the theory of comparative advantage says that the reason why countries trade with one another is because they differ in their factors of production. A factor of production is an input to the uh, to the production process. And probably the most important factor of production is labor. So you, don't, you can't produce anything without labor. Uh, in fact, labor is not, there is high skill labor and there is low skill labor. And from the standpoint of the theory of comparative advantage, the reason why countries trade with one another is because they differ in their relative endowments of high skill and low skill labor. But let me illustrate what I mean. Uh, let's, let's look at two countries. One is a, a rich country, one is a developing country. The reason why the rich country is rich is to make it rich or make it poor. So rich countries have a higher proportion of high-skilled workers. Developing countries have a higher proportion of low-skilled workers. That difference means that rich countries have a comparative advantage in producing goods where high-skilled workers are particularly needed. Goods such as computer software, highly technical goods. Developing countries have a comparative advantage producing goods where skill doesn't matter so much. And agricultural goods, such as rice, tend to fall in this category. Now, what I want to do is to examine the effects of globalization on production uh, and according to the theory of comparative advantage. And to do that, what I'm going to do is to perform a thought experiment. I, I want to look at production before globalization occurs, that is, before the rich country and the poor country, the developing country, can trade with one another. And then I want to look at production after globalization has occurred, after trade has opened up. And the difference between those two must be the results of, of the increase in globalization. So what will happen before globalization occurs, before the rich country and the developing country can trade? Well, if, if the rich country can't trade, then anything that its consumers get to consume, anything that citizens of the rich country get to consume, must be produced in the rich country. So that means that the rich country is going to have to produce both software and rice if 
citizens of a rich country are going to get to consume both software and rice. And similarly, in the developing country, both software and rice will have to be produced if citizens in that country get both goods. Oops, of the labor force, because after all, the labor force has mostly unskilled workers. And so to the, to, to the extent that software is uh, being produced, and remember, software requires high-skilled workers. To the extent that, that software is being produced, it's a distortion of the best use of the developing country's labor force. In, in other words, the, the low producers don't need these low-skilled workers. That means that there's not going to be uh, much demand for, uh, for the low-skill workers' services. That means that uh, to the extent that production is put into software rather than rice, uh, the wage for those skilled workers will be depressed. But just the opposite is true for the high skill workers in the developing country if software is produced. High skill workers are very much needed for software, and therefore uh, their wages will be elevated. What happens once the door be between the two countries is opened and there's free trade between the rich country and the developing country? Well, now, uh, the rich country doesn't have to produce rice anymore, software anymore. It can concentrate on rice and import its software from the rich country. So the developing country now produces more rice and less software than before. This means that the demand for low-skilled workers is higher than before because uh, the low-skilled workers are very much needed for rice, not so much for software. And now the, the country is producing more rice, so it needs more low-skill workers. So the low-skill workers' wages rise, and just the opposite occurs for the high-skill workers. They, are, they aren't much needed for rice, so if, if there's a shift from software to rice, their wages fall. And that is what we mean by a decrease in inequality. The low skill wages come up, the high skill wages come down, the gap between rich and poor is now smaller than before. And that is what advocates of globalization said would happen. That's, that's what advocates of globalization, uh, that, that's why advocates of globalization said that globalization would re reduce inequality. Well, for all previous globalizations, they were right. But for this particular one, this latest one, they were wrong. And uh, it's because they were wrong that I got interested in this topic myself. I, I, I wondered how could a theory which had been so successful for so many years, the theory of comparative advantage, get things so wrong this time around. And Michael Kramer has been developing an alternative theory, a, a, a theory which provides not, not so much a uh, completely different theory from, from comparative advantage, but a supplement to comparative advantage, which allows us to see why the current globalization is so different from the, from the previous globalizations that uh, the world has experienced. So nationalized production. 
So one example of the internationalization of production is provided by computers. Computers are an example of international production because computers are typically designed in one country, say the US, they're programmed someplace else, perhaps in Europe, and these days that's very often China. So computers are a great example of how pr production has been internationalized. But they're just one example out of many, many examples. And if we think of globalization as the internationalization of production, we can begin to understand why global markets have actually increased in quality. But let me uh, describe this. Before I was talking about high skill and low skill workers, but of course, in reality, there are many levels of skill. Uh, for my purposes today, uh, I'm going to concentrate on uh, just four levels, but that just to make uh, my presentation simple. Uh, if, if, uh, if I were doing this uh, in its full-fledged glory, uh, I would have a process consisting of different tasks. So in order to, to produce something, you need to bring together the people to fulfill the different production tasks that are involved. Uh, and again, usually uh, in, in production there are many tasks that have to be performed, particularly for something as complicated as computers. But for, and I suppose that that's very sensitive to the skill level. And the other I'll call the subordinate task, which is not so sensitive to the skill level. I'll, I'll focus on just two countries, one rich, one poor, or challenging. Uh, the reason why the rich country is rich is because it has workers of higher skills. So let me call the skill levels of the rich country A and B. Let me call the skill is bigger than D. In this theory, uh, output is produced by matching uh, managers and subordinates, or bringing together the managerial task and the subordinate task, and put all of different skill levels. The amount of output you get from a particular company is going to depend. All tasks are equally sensitive to the skill. Okay, so let me let me do the same kind of thought experiment that I did when I was talking about the theory of comparative advantage. I want to look at the production pattern and the and the matching pattern before globalization occurs. And here, remember, globalization means the ability to produce goods across. Uh, and I want to compare that with what happens after globalization occurs, after it becomes possible to bring together in the same company people from different countries, to match people in a, country, in a poor country with people in a rich country. All right, so it, this is the pre-globalization pattern um, in the highest level of skill matched with the A workers who have the highest level of skill. The, the A workers perform the managerial task. That's very, in a rich country, we have only people living in the rich country. And in a poor country, we have only people living in but that's before globalization. And workers in the rich country. And, and that, in fact, is the pattern that we get. The, it's more advantageous for the sea workers to the 
D workers. So, so the, the C workers all take jobs where they're matched. With. Now, what effect does this have on wages? What effect does it have on inequality? Well, with people who are more highly skilled than you, that raises chance. We, we, we want to work with, with um, highly skilled people because that means the C workers have this great new opportunity, the, the opportunity to work with B workers. They didn't have that before globalization. So C worker wages actually is the cause of increasing inequality. So inequality goes up as a result of globalization. That, that was the question I wanted to answer. We want to ask, what can we do about it? How, how can we, the, the obvious thing to do is to try to ration so that they too have the opportunity. We can't, we can't expect themselves to make the investments because we're talking about highly unskilled people, people with very little. They, can't, they simply can't afford to pay for their own training and education. So they're not going to be the answer. We, if you hire me and you give me training, you're going to, to train me, I can go off and work for your competitor. And in that case, your investment is lost altogether. And so although, of course, in, in, in practice, private companies do provide quite a lot of inequality. So if producers are not doing it, and workers are not doing it, we're going to have to turn to some third party to make the investment in training. Uh, and there's also a role for international <coughs> organizations like the World Bank and NGOs uh, to get into the act. Foreign aid from rich countries for for private foundations. Uh, you should not take away from my remarks today the lesson that globalization is a bad idea for development. Actually, I would argue very strongly in countries, but in the long run, it's probably the only idea which is going to lift developing countries up and, and make them rich. That's how all previous rich countries got rich. So it would be a big mistake to conclude from the phenomenon of increasing inequality. We need to deal with globalization, with, with inequality. And I would argue that the, that the proper response is to allow the low skill workers of the world, the D workers, in the theory that I've shown you, have other uh, economic questions, I'd be happy to try to address those as well. Uh, perhaps, some, perhaps someone uh, can be in charge of recognizing members of the audience. I, I, I don't want to do it because... Um, and, and it is a great honor to have the opportunity to come here and listen to your presentation. Uh, my name is Kathy and I just got my master from Monash University in International Development and Environmental Analysis. It is a really interesting topic to me as a student doing international development. And my question would be in globalization, mainly the topic that we are talking about today, reducing inequality. We, like, uh, sorry. 
the negative impact that we are talking about today, uh, inequality, we delve it, if we have actually used a different theory instead of the narrative advantage to explain the process of globalization. And also, the second question is dealing with the alternative theories that you are suggesting in, as an alternative to comparative analysis. My question in terms of that would be, given the success of comparative advantage as a theory to explain the product or the outcome of globalization, what is so special about the alternative theory that you are proposing instead of just comparing the merits in terms of ABCD? Thank you. Uh, 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 you asked about comparative advantage theory, some other theory. Uh, the, the answer to that question, I think, is the answer uh, that applies Whenever you're trying to answer a question scientifically, you use the theory which best fits the facts that you're trying to explain. The advantage theory fit the facts very well, and that's why it's become such a well-established uh, building block of economics. But if the if circumstances change, globalization, the theory has to change too. Uh, and, and, and so, in, in all cases, you want a theory which does a good job of explaining what you actually see, and which should, should be, shouldn't be thought of as an op, in opposition to comparative advantage theory, but as adding another feature that comparative advantage theory doesn't have. Uh, so, so why does this alternative theory do a better job? Uh, fitting the facts, it, I, I think it's it's uh, because the alternative theory can accommodate the internationalization of production. You see, uh, one uh, very important feature, of most recent globalization, has been. It's no longer single countries which are responsible for production. Uh, in all developing countries, there is, for example, a very important role for foreign investment. Well, foreign investment is really a form of in international production. That, in, in the early 19th century, you didn't have, uh, except in the case of colonialization, uh, foreign colonies, uh, you didn't have uh, the, the enormous scale of uh, foreign investment that you have these days. So, so the, 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 the new theory does accommodate this, comparative advantage theory does not. Uh, my name is Paul Kane. I'm from uh, the Economic Institute of Cambodia. Uh, I have a few questions in regard to your uh, theory because I see that you have classified four levels of the labor force. So that uh, I want to know how you classify that uh, four level. And the second question is, uh, I see that the level of uh, labor classification seems to be absolutely bigger than other one. Because in the late country and CNE, I pay in the poor country. And the third question is uh, relevant to the inequality. Uh, you, because uh, how can you explain the in, uh, inequality between the poor country and the rich country or within the poor country themselves? Okay, thank you. important for, for my conclusions is the idea that the rich country has more people of higher skill than the poor country, or at least a higher has higher proportion of higher skilled people. And furthermore, uh, there are at least four different skill levels. I don't think either assumption is, is very controversial. I think I think uh, I think without doubt, richer countries do. Then, um, 
just want to know because you assume uh, the A is bigger than B, but it seems to be absolutely bigger, not uh, relative, uh, relatively bigger. That that I think it's impossible. A workers have more skill than B workers. Uh, if let, let's say uh, you assume that A is the manager level force and B is subordinate and C uh, no, manager. Sorry, I, 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 I'm not assuming that I'm not assuming that A workers perform managerial roles. That is a consequence of their having higher skills. Be because uh, the managerial role is more sensitive to skill, you will prefer to have higher skill people in the managerial role, but that is a consequence of the theory, not an assumption of the theory. 80 billion per year. So uh, I just wonder uh, what happened right now is, and uh, how many percentage of the weapon industry in the U.S. GDP and uh, is there any other industry that can make more money than the weapons, ship, and airplanes. And uh, do you think that the weapon industry is part of, uh, of A? Be yes, because... Uh, it's been the United States' role to intervene, not always wisely, I'm afraid, but, but to intervene uh, when... You know, I would prefer to see this, this role as, as policemen uh, shared more equally, uh, in particular, uh, it, it would, I, I think it would, we would all be better off if, if Europe uh, monopolized by the U.S. Thanks for your question. Thank you, Dr. Maskin, for giving me this session for people in the U.S. I basically have two questions. The first is uh, uh, to uh, the day worker to, uh, to use the inequality. So my first question is, uh, I don't really uh, understand clearly myself on how uh, we match the skill of C and D in the practical things. But uh, from my understanding, like in the case of the government sector in Cambodia, I see more important questions when they come to Cambodia the skill that they take is not the low skill that unskilled worker. So I see more it's uh, in this government factory case, I see more is the matching between B and D skill level. And if that is the case, then in Cambodia now we are in the situation that now working with the government industry, into the maybe the C level skill worker to be uh, so that they can be able to move into the management. And to make sure that after uh, the government factory move out, we have the existing skill, not just the non skill level. And this is my first question. Uh, so, so could, could you? Okay. So oh, my please. question is that, um, for in Cambodian, in German factory, yeah, we, uh, from understanding, I think we have the matching, from this globalization, we have the matching between B and D. But we still have the inequality in charge. And my second question is about the last, I think the example of, for example, in rice sector. Um, now Cambodia have exported some country, but we have limitation in terms of the quality that we can produce and also the quality to comply to the international standard. So we basically can produce only some limitation of quality and we can export to only a part of the potential market that actually we can if we have a better enabling environment through maybe the good infrastructure that can be used to uh, transportation costs or the irrigation system other technology. So for me, I think, um, from my understanding, so maybe in a nutshell, I think that uh, more than the training, you have another, uh, we need another energy environment, like as I mentioned earlier, it can be infrastructure, how you can help the producer to link to the international market. So my, to sum up my question is whether the training that you mean is there, if, uh, you can elaborate more on the training that you mean. That you said that when we increase, because uh, for me, now I think there yeah, may be another thing, the enabling environment that I say no more. It may be include the linkage to the market, technology, um, infrastructure. Thank you. Let, let me say something about, about the second question. 
So you, you, you mentioned uh, uh, the possibility of uh, investing in agriculture, say rice production, which I think uh, is an important uh, development opportunity for Cambodia. So, so there's talk about uh, introducing modern agricultural techniques, irrigation, uh, planting, uh, improving the seeds, that, rice seeds that are used, uh, use of fertilizer, in order to upgrade uh, the uh, rice industry in Cambodia. All of those steps require the people actually doing the rice production, acquiring some skills. You, you, you can't undertake modern agriculture, modern farming, without the training and knowledge that uh, modern farming requires. Modern agriculture is very different from subsistence agriculture. It, it, it cannot be performed by what I'm calling the deed workers. People have to have some skills. However, if they do have those skills, it, it, it's through the, the development of rice production for export that, uh, that Cambodia can uh, can successfully expand its agricultural sector. So, so I, I think your example actually fits very well into, the, into this view uh, that I've been laying out. Thanks very much for the question. Um, okay, I'll, I'll take one in the back from the World Bank and the trade economist here. Uh, very great to have you here today. Suddenly, the implications of your model are rather disturbing from some aspects. And uh, I, I take the, the policy implication, which is that we need to invest in retraining. Are there any broader policy implications you would? you would look to in the international trading system, the, the superstructure, the architecture of international trade to resolve some of these issues. The retraining and, uh, and, and educational business, uh, like every other business, uh, depends on effective organization uh, to be a success. So uh, I, I've, been, I've been talking to, to people, uh, not so much from the World Bank, but uh, from the UN about uh, need to know how to do it effectively. So, so, so ju just as it's important that, uh, that, uh, that, that the deworkers workers uh, learn these new techniques in order to elevate their position, uh, so uh, people providing advice about new techniques need to learn how to, to teach this. So that, that suggests that uh, these are already doing programs and conveying uh, job training techniques to the bee workers of the world. That that that's uh, something um, that I've been that I've been discussing. Um, If you have your own ideas, I'd be glad to hear them. Well, I guess it, it just speaks to, and I'll be very quick, it, it speaks to something we look at.
Peter, it's something you thought about. It's, it's uh, something we call services mode for. It's something you thought about with respect to your colleagues. And perhaps it's something we can make a final review later. But perhaps it, it is something within the architecture of the, of the global trading system, such as that rule that, uh, that is preventing some of the more often.
uh, would help diversify uh, Cambodia's uh, uh, export industries, and, and that would also protect it better from local downturns. So, so two suggestions for, but, but they're all. In of the student value study of the UN. Uh, first of all, I would like to express my uh, thanks and appreciation for uh, for your uh, wonderful presentation, uh, which I feel I know uh, one more thing about the uh, economics, the alternative uh, model to the competitive advantage. Um, you just mentioned uh, that. Uh, Cambodia, oh, U.S. is the main uh, trading partner of Cambodia. That is why I, you know, one of Cambodians, I would like to know how healthy is the U.S. economy right now? Uh, you know, given the present context of the uh, global and financial uh, global crisis, um, uh, as you just mentioned, our export to U.S. has been down more in the the training of the kind of levels uh, mm. okay. But also in the presentation you mentioned about the positive effect of globalization, yeah. where all stakeholders, rich and poor countries, are benefit, uh, benefit from this uh, globalization trend. So is that fair in turn to say that uh, the rich country has the responsibility to help the poor to train the lead workers in the poor countries. Thank you. Okay, thank you for those questions. So, so I don't think anyone can say uh, for sure when the U.S. economy will get back to, to normal or to the position it was in before the crisis. That kind of uh, economic forecasting is sort of like trying to predict what the weather is going to be next year. Uh, it's just a little bit too long term uh, for uh, our predictive, our current predictive powers. Uh, what I can say is that um, it's, it's by now quite clear that the worst is over uh, in, in the U.S. and that the economy is improving but, and, and, and almost certainly will continue to improve. Uh, probably normal, but uh, we will get back to normal. Uh, and uh, as the improvement occurs, I hope that that will also mean that, uh, that Cambodia will get back to normal. Garment industry will uh, will uh, improve and uh, and tourism will improve. The two two industries which were particularly hard hit. Well, may, uh, maybe in the interest of giving. the theory of comparative advantage and your theory on our country theory. And I just would like you to explain more on that theory because I uh, have learned that there is another theory on the international product bicycle theory. And the two theory the same or they all that in some time. I just would like from uh, comparative that is, that is I, I'm not suggesting that we get rid of comparative advantage theory, but rather to supplement it, to allow for, for the possibility of international production and international investments. 
the, the classical theory of comparative advantage didn't incorporate those features, uh, but that those features are such a part of uh, modern life, modern globalization, that uh, we do need to account for them, and that, and that was the purpose of, of the alternative theory that I outlined for you this afternoon. So it's not to replace the comparative advantage theory, but to supplement it. It's Christine Holland Harry here. My name is Brett. I came from uh, Richard Fan. I have two questions. Uh, uh, maybe, maybe we better confine it to one if you don't mind. Yes, yeah. Okay, let me choose one question. Um, when we talk about globalization, mainly we talk about uh, export and import, right? So I want to know is Cambodia ready for that globalization? Cambodia is not Cambodia. The, the remarkable success of uh, you know, the last uh, era, the, the last uh, uh, 11, 12 years, has been attributable in large part to globalization. And I, I hope globalization will uh, actually speed up. I, I, Global markets are not interested in people who don't have any skills to offer. And therefore, uh, since many people in Cambodia are without skills, they are going to get left behind. They are not going to see their lives improved by globalization. Do something about it. I think actually the answer is yes. Uh, uh, I, I think uh, we should think of uh, the world as a community. Rich countries derive a lot of benefit from developing countries, the, the, the opportunity to trade with them. Rich countries uh, therefore skills uh, because markets, markets are not going to do that training on their own. Uh, someone has to take the for the stock exchange that will be uh, that will be happening in Cambodia now. And I want to ask you one question. In Cambodia's condition nowadays, do stock exchange can uh, help the com uh, Cambodian economy or make it worse? Can you tell us about the effect of uh, stock exchange in Cambodia according to Cambodia's situation now? Thank you. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't really catch that question. Uh, I think it was the advantage of uh, the stock exchange for Oh, okay. I think it's a good idea to be invented. Okay, so, so yes, uh, uh, I, I, think, uh, it's, I think it's a good idea. Uh, that is, part of uh, economic developments, or an, an important part of economic developments uh, is the development of on banks for finance. But that but there's there's a limit to how much chance that one way of dramatically expanding your access to finance to, to capital is by letting everybody into the end. So a stock market, stock market is going to open up uh, the possibility of finance to, to a much broader uh, set of financiers. This will be good for companies. They will be able to raise more capital. It will also be good. Uh, hello, Dr. Askin. Thank you for your incredible presentation. And here I have one question. I would like to get to the real big question. Uh, does the stock exchange market have a part in the cost of inequality or not? So, the, so does the stock exchange, uh, potentially, stock market can can work against inequality. That is, uh, it's, it's a way uh, for people to uh, 
improve their well-being, their uh, investment. We know that in many countries, the people who actually invest uh, in the stock markets are the rich. So in reality, in many countries, the, uh, the stock market makes the rich richer and, they are, and therefore increases inequality. So, uh, uh, what actually happens in practice uh, remains to be seen. If citizens are, I was talking about the importance of training uh, to, to raise skills. Uh, you also need some education to know how to invest. If, if people are given the opportunity to understand what a stock market is and how to put their money into a stock market, uh, help reduce inequality. Uh, but this will depend very much on uh, how, uh, on whether or not such uh, training is actually introduced. I very much hope it will be. University Rector is asking to see Tom to present a gift to Professor Edmonds. to thank all of you. Uh, I, I agree uh, that the questions were excellent, and I very much enjoyed having a chance to discuss them with you. Thank you.
Good to see you. Thanks. Okay. Bye-bye. So, see you. Oh, see you. Chris, may I take a photo? Yes. Uh, yes, sure. I will give you your photo. I have this one. Can you have it? Yeah. I Only the photos. Okay. I see. Yeah.